Hey guys. Hey everybody. How are you today? We are just gonna wait on Dr. Natush to get here and join us in a second. I'm in the crush room today. You guys wanna have a little peek around while we're waiting on Dan. Oh, there's Dan and Dan's gonna join us. Okay. <laughs> Hey. G'day. How are, How are you? you? I'm well, thank you. You look like you're in the tannery. Yeah, you look like you're in quarantined at the house. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> How's everything going with you? You know, uh, this is a new norm for us. It's a new, uh, definitely a new way to work, a new way to live. And, uh, oh. Hello, Juice. You all right there, mate? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's just a new norm. And I think it's not just a new norm for us. It's a new norm for everybody. Um, so guys, let me introduce you, um, to my fuzzy friend. His, his Wi-Fi connection is a little fuzzy, but, um, he'll probably come back into focus in a minute. Um, this is Dr. Dan Natouche. Um, Dan is from Australia originally, and he currently lives in France. Um, and I have known Dan for several years and Dan's background is he is, um, an ecologist, a biologist. Um, he is a CITES policy specialist. Um, he is a snake researcher. He spends a lot of his time in Malaysia, Indonesia, and other places where you catch nasty things like malaria. <laughs> and, um, so his, his passion, though, is saving reptiles from extinction. And he has consulted with every major luxury brand in Europe. I'm talking big brands um, to make sure that he explains to them the importance of uh, if they are involved in this trade, how they have to do it correctly and how they can um, help not only species, but habitats, indigenous people, um, and also to be responsible as they're doing it. So um, Dan, if I missed anything there, tell everybody a little bit about your background, I guess, where you went to school, um, how you got into being someone who loves snakes and crocs and lizards. Absolutely, well, thank you very much, firstly, for having me, Christy. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, as mentioned, my name is, is Dan Nartouche. I'm actually a New Zealander originally, but I oh, had a passion for reptiles, specifically snakes. And as you all know, I'm sure there's a lot of snakes in Australia. So I made the jump at 17 when I left school to Australia to follow that passion. And that passion grew actually in North America. Um, I spent a lot of my time as a, as a small person watching wildlife documentaries and then visited my brother in Vancouver um, when I was about 11 years old. And you've probably seen on Discovery Channel and on Nat Geo, you have your garter snakes. Garter snakes are small little grass snakes that are common throughout North America. And in the north of their range, in Canada, they den together in the winter in these big balls of writhing snakes, just hundreds, thousands of snakes. And I was in British Columbia and came across a... Uh, a, a relatively small aggregation of these snakes and was able to pick up 50 to 100 snakes in my hand at a time. And since the age of 11, I, I fell in love with those critters and decided to dedicate my life to better understanding and conserving them. And as Christy said, now I uh, work as a, a wildlife ecologist and biologist, and increasingly I am moving from uh, the pure science and research into the realm of well, the terrifying world of biopolitics, where we're trying to navigate international policy and apply science, the best science we have, to ensure that the decisions 
that are being made by people in high places, whether they be um, whether they be conservation organisations or politicians that know nothing about wildlife, or whether they be luxury brands or people using um, these resources, we want to ensure that they're making the best decisions for uh, those wildlife species. And so that has become a particular passion of mine. Okay. Um, oh, whoops, sorry. Um, so, Dan, your Wi-Fi is a little fuzzy. I don't know if we can do anything to turn your Wi-Fi up. Maybe you could, if you've got something else, you could... Can you tell your wife to get off Netflix? <laughs> I can uh, I can move around in the house, but apart from that, I am not sure what I can do. I'll, um, well, how, is it getting better? Uh, that seems better. I mean, you're gonna know your spots in your house. You get Wi-Fi spots in your house. I'm, I'm in my op office, which usually works. So, I think oh, there this you might go. Be as good now, as now we've got you. Now. Now we can see your face. Um, cool. So, uh, Dan, tell everybody a little bit about um, the article that you wrote that sort of sent shockwaves through the fashion community. Um, it was in Business of Fashion. It was right after Chanel decided um, to announce that they were no longer going to use exotics. And, um, and what that sort of you know, what, what your insight to that was and how you felt about that and why you took the time to write that article in Business of Fashion with a group of scientists. Yeah, sure. So for a bit of background and context, I started and am still the scientific director of a multi-stakeholder initiative, one of those big words that doesn't mean much often, a multi-stakeholder initiative that brings together much of the luxury industry. Also brings together governments in, in Asia, where reptiles are sourced. It brings governments in Europe together. Basically, the important stakeholders around the table to, um, to, to ensure that sourcing is sustainable, legal, humane, transparent, and all those buzzwords. And so, so was, wait, let me, let me inter interrupt you. So when you talk about governments that are involved in one of these organizations, you really mean the wildlife division of that government. It's not, so for example, if you were to say that you were involved or involved with Malaysia, you're not talking about being involved with the Malaysian presidential administration. You're talking about being involved with the Malaysian CITES authority, which are a group of biologists and scientists just like you as well, correct? But they're also that, policymakers. That, that is absolutely correct. So it's the equivalent of us engaging with and having around our steering committee the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, not Donald Trump himself, obviously. Correct. Okay. Um, but, but that being said, those government people are the recognized decision makers when it comes to use of wildlife and other natural resources, and they are the ones directly influencing policy at the highest levels when it comes to that specific um, focal area. So they're, they're the really important ones that we want to get on board. And in addition, they're the ones that allow us to make the real tangible change on the ground. Okay. Okay, so we started this initiative and it's called the Southeast Asian Reptile Conservation Alliance. And ironically, Chanel was a part of it. And Chanel were actually leaders in what they were doing. The people that we were involved with, and we just spoke about um, the, the nuance of uh, positions within a government a big fashion brand is no different. Different. You have your designers and you have your CEOs and then you have your sustainability people and your operations people. We, as part of SARCA, had the operations people and the sustainability people right on board. And they were significant contributors. They were really forward thinking. They wanted to improve things and continue use of exotic skins into the future because they understood what was going on, partly because of their engagement and work with us. However, what happens is that commonly someone gets into the air of someone in a high position, which is what happened within Chanel and said, you need to stop doing this. And so Chanel made a rapid and rash decision to stop using wildlife products in their, um, in, in their luxury product lines. And that included crocodilians, alligators, snakes, lizards, you know, exotic skins. 
And now that came as a bit of a shock to us and certainly the other people within the Chanel family um, because of the enormous benefits that trade can give to conservation of wildlife and their habitats. And it was on that level and that disappointment that we had because many people within that, that organization, Chanel, knew that, that we wanted to set the record straight and say, hey, actually, this may do more harm for species conservation and in particular and importantly for habitat conservation. And so we penned an article just so that everyone would understand the ramifications of decisions like that and also to prevent a snowballing flow-on effect whereby other people saw that a leader, you know, Chanel's a big brand, if they pull out, then other people may have been thinking, hmm, maybe we should too. And we didn't want that to occur, at least without people having all of the knowledge in hand and understanding the consequences of that decision. And so we penned the article, and to my understanding, it certainly hit its mark and, and, um, and was reflected positively by, by the people who it was intended to. So let me ask you this, Dan, talking about, um, you know, conservation of species and habitats and, and fashion designers in the most simple way, um, without getting into like too, too much detail. Um, can you give an example of, for example, a case study, a scientific case study that shows, that really proves how fashion brands have contributed to the conservation of species and where would these animals and their habitats be? Where would the people be? And give people a little background about what life is like in places like Malaysia or Indonesia or, or the Northern Territory in Australia where the Aboriginals collect eggs. Um, you know, I've preached this story about, you know, Louisiana, um, you know, there's, but there's other stories in Africa and other places, many of which where the people depend on the wildlife to live and how how that all works, because it's so confusing to people, so. Sure, well, I, I will, forgive me, I'm a scientist, and so the details is what I uh, do for a living, but I'll try and put this into a nutshell so it's easily understandable for everyone. So, if you're really poor, and you're living on, say, one US dollars a, dollars a day, and which is commonly the case in a place like Indonesia, which is a population of 270 million people, and so 50% of those people live on less than one US dollar a day. For them, a big python or a crocodile is a dangerous predator. I mean, I just got sent a video a couple of days ago by a friend in Indonesia and a seven meter articulated python had wrapped up a local villager and almost killed him. And in the past two years, about five people have been killed and eaten by just going about their usual activities in and around their homes in forested areas in Indonesia. These snakes are the largest in the world. They kill and they eat people. Similarly, a crocodile, a Nile crocodile, you've seen National Geographic with the wildebeest trying to cross the rivers. People are also using those water resources. And so those animals in there are extremely dangerous for not only their own survival, but also for their livelihoods because they eat people's livestock, their, their goats and their sheep and their cattle and so on. And so if you're living on a dollar a day and you're struggling to survive as it is, you don't want a big, dirty, great crocodile or snake coming and eating you. I mean, it, it, it's pretty straightforward. You actually want to get rid of that animal to make your life easier. And so for many years, in many parts of the world, we saw that that was happening. Animals were just being killed. They were being shot because they were worthless. And so we as conservationists had a bit of a problem. How do we conserve the animals that we care about when they're eating people? Whenever we would tell those people, hey, maybe you should actually conserve them, they would turn around and go, are you, are you crazy? Are you nuts? Why would we keep that there? when it's such a problem for us. And they make a very good point. We would all probably want crocodilians and large snakes gone if we had to bear the costs of living with them. So we had to come up with a different strategy. And luckily, we had the industry 
focused on leather, industries focused on meat, industries focused on several other products that you get from these animals, like their blood, which is used for medicinal purposes. And we were able to say, hey, if you maintain healthy, stable populations of these important animals in those ecosystems, and remember to maintain the habitat that those animals need, which is great for us because all the other biodiversity that lives in a wetland is also conserved. If you maintain those animals and that you take a few of them and sell their meat and skins and so on, then you'll get a livelihood benefit that offsets the costs of living with those species. And so people suddenly said, hey, okay, with better education, we're going to... Um, not go down to the water at this point, or we're going to change the places where we take water from the river, and we're going to tolerate these animals because we know that the sale of a few of those individuals is going to generate an enormous amount of money that significantly influences and benefits our livelihoods. And so that is ultimately the story around this. And so for us, that has been wonderful because yes, I mean, I'm an animal lover. I, as I told you when I started when I got on the video, I, I do what I do because I love animals. But I can absolutely reconcile the fact that some of them are killed under very humane and strict, and these are some of the strictest regulations in the world when it comes to animal use. They, some individuals are killed under strict protocols, and the benefit is that everything else is conserved and not, and from a conservationist point of view, it's not just gators and crocs and snakes that I want to conserve. I want to conserve tigers and I want to conserve uh, all the wetland fish that prop up the rest of the biodiversity and the rest of the predators, the turtles and the other snakes and so on that rely on those fish. And to do that, we need those habitats intact. And so this one animal in this one trade, because of the money generated from it, is enough to say to local people who are right there living alongside wildlife, hey, all right, I'm going to conserve those animals in those habitats because they're worth more to me alive at the species level than they are if I get rid of them. And so that is the story behind conservation through sustainable use, which has played out again and again and again. And not just, I mean, we're not picking on, on exotic skins, Conservation through sustainable use is a widely accepted form of conservation, heavily practiced actually in the United States. The United States is one of the most successful sustainable use or conservation through sustainable use programs in the world. And this has played out for mammals, birds, reptiles, um, many, many different species. So, so what would happen, for example, if all of a sudden all of these fashion brands got out of the exotic leather business, what would happen? Alligators, crocs, snakes, if they just tomorrow stopped, they were out, what would happen? Well, you would have hundreds of millions or billions of dollars worth of loss, money that is no longer going to those local communities. And those local communities would no longer have the livelihood. And so they would need to, out of necessity, just like any of us would, find a different source of income. You still need to put food on the table, still need to buy medicine, still need to send the kids to school. So they're going to find an alternative. And unfortunately, intensive agriculture in these places is commonly the alternative that they seek. Instead of having one billabong, which Aboriginal people have in Northern Australia, where you might have 20 crocodile nests around the billabong, and a billabong is a swamp, correct? Like a, a marsh. A, a, apologies. It's, a, it's like a big, a big lake or lagoon okay. type of thing. And so in the billabong, you might have 20 croc nests each year. And um, there's 60 eggs in each nest. And each egg can be worth 20 US dollars. And so you take 80% of the eggs from each nest and ensure that there's still a good number that can hatch and survive and replenish the, the natural population. The rest are taken and sold. And yeah, you earn $30,000 off your billabong. You're going to make sure your billabong is the most heavily protected site in the whole area 
because that's a significant amount of income for anyone, let alone an Aboriginal person living in a rural part of Northern Australia. And so you remove that and they go, oh, well, we're kind of stuffed now. We're going to drain that billabong. We're going to drain that swamp and we're going to turn it into intensive agricultural land and we're going to grow cows. And I know that a lot of people are farmers. Most of my family are farmers and I don't begrudge them for that. But if we're being honest, a monoculture of grass as green and beautiful and rolling hills as it may be, is not the best thing for biodiversity. There aren't many animals that can live in a monoculture of grass. And so this is what we are trying to prevent. And we're trying to put a value on natural resources that actually um, allow people to maintain those intact habitats. And like I said, this is, this is one reason how, and if all those brands pull out, then the risk that we face as conservationists is, okay, now the animals have become pests again. They have no value to these people. The habitats have no value to these people. So they're going to get cut down. The animals are going to get shot. We need to find another strategy as conservationists because at the moment we had a system that was working, but now all these brands are gone. We ain't got nothing. So tell everybody, what is the number one cause of animal extinction? Habitat loss. Habitat loss. What is the number one way to protect habitats? Uh, well, the, the, I, I'm not going to lie and say that this is the only way to protect habitats. In some countries, you can put a big, great, dirty, big fence around the, the, the protected area. You designate it a protected area. You call it a national park and you spend a lot of money trying to keep people out and to keep the That's wildlife money. safe. Taxpayers' money, exactly, exactly. The, the other way is to make the resource or the wildlife pay for itself. And so, again, you can take a small percentage of the funds used to protect the habitats and to pay for the enforcement, and, and this is the other paradigm that is used. And so there, it doesn't so much matter how it's done or where, where the money comes from, but there needs to be money, whether it's taxpayers' dollars or whether it's money generated from levies on the harvest of wildlife or the trade in skins or, or whatever it may be. And so this is the mechanism that, that many people have found and many conservationists have found and governments have found really works. So on the, the, the videos that people have seen that, that the PETA videos that have come out that showed like, or the one that came out in Switzerland that showed someone with a snake heart beating in its hand. Tell me about the, the, physiolo the physiology, sorry, of reptiles and why some of these shock value videos are like, don't mean anything. Sorry, Chris. We losing me? Go on, sake. Are you there? My Wi-Fi is a little bit crappy at the moment. We're good. Um, We're good now. So, no. What my question was um, for you to explain the physiology behind reptiles and why some of these shock value PETA videos. Um, like, let's talk about that and give people a little bit of science behind it. You're spinning again, so you might have to go back into your office. Well, we were just getting to some good stuff, guys. While Dan's paused, oh, we've lost him, but he'll probably come back in just a minute. Um, so, let me tell you a little bit about the way that um, I know Dan and how I work with him. Um, Dan is a member of the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. It is the most important conservation um, organization in the world. They have United Nations observer status. Um, they advise CITES on species and he's gonna come back. So just give it a minute. Um, but he's the guy, so he goes to all of these CITES meetings and he, is fighting for conservation of reptiles, plain and simple. But he sees a link between 
responsible use from fashion brands uh, and tanneries and people that are invested in this industry. And one of the things that I like to point out to people is that, um, you know, if you look around this room and you see all of these skins that are here, they're all alligators. Here's a stack next to me that I have to grade. Every single one of them has one of these tags on it. Um, every single one in this room. They were all acquired legally. They were all harvested in accordance with state, federal, international laws. Um, and I have to produce something that is a, um, that a, that's a regular product. I'm not trying to produce one, uh, you know, type of exotic leather. I have zero interest in using anything that's endangered. As a matter of fact, I want to see that any endangered reptile, particularly a crocodile, is conserved. And, and we, as um, Americans who have set this, um, who have set up these policies, that we actually try to go in and help other governments to try to bring their crocodiles back. Um, so if you were to take a look at every single predatory animal in the world that is on the endangered species list or has been on the endangered species list, and you look at the ones that have sustainable use programs like alligators, crocodiles, snakes, lizards, vicuna, um, and all of these other animals, you will see that all of their species and their numbers every year are going up, 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 up. And if you take a look at ones that are not used, um, if you take a look at the ones that are not used, you'll see that all of those are going down. Um, and it's, it's just a, it's just the facts. I and mean, these are not things that I came up with. I'm not smart enough, but people like um, Dr. Natush and other scientists who have, you know, led the way for this, they figured out how it works. Um, so, you know, again, in some of these videos that you've seen, the PETA videos, they are intended to be shock value videos. I've watched them and I am sick to my stomach as I watch them because it, it hurts me because I love animals too. I know that I'm sitting in a room full of, of dead alligators and crocodiles, but I would be so sad if we didn't have this industry because I, I've been out in the wetlands in Louisiana and those places just wouldn't exist. Um, another thing that is a, something that, you know, a lot of people don't know is that, you know, as we talk about global warming and we talk about, um, you know, you know, our earth's temperatures heating up, you know, we know that these greenhouse gases have to be cleaned out of the air. And one, one of the things that I found out is that terrestrial rainforests or trees um, are very important for cleaning the air, but wetlands and marshes clean four times that amount out of the air, four times. They sequester four times the carbon. Um, and all of those wetlands are kept intact, at least in the U.S., by private landowners. And their number one source of income, or one of their most important sources of income, is, um, let's see, Dan's trying to join here now. One of their most important sources of income is the sale of alligator eggs. So they keep their land intact exactly for that reason. So it, I'm talking to them right now, Dan, you, you bumped out, but I'm talking to them about wetlands and uh, carbon sequestration. So, uh, and that's something that Dan has studied on and he actually wrote an article recently. It's not been published yet, but sorry if that's too much. But um, so there's more benefits besides that, that this type of trade provides than just um, conservation of species. It's also conservation of habitats, again, like he was saying. And a big, big benefit of that is cleaning the air. So, you know those types of things by keeping our lands pristine and keeping our earth intact and keeping biodiversity intact, we're doing more than just, you know, saving snakes and crocs and lizards and alligators. I don't Absolutely. know. Absolutely. So sorry for, sorry for dropping out there. I actually reside in France now to be closer to some of these luxury folk and the internet isn't too great. Um, I'm going to have kids running around. Um, That's okay. They might come and jump on me, but, Oh, wait, wait, um, let's talk about the picture of your baby that you were feeding to the snake. Let's talk well, about that. I had a lot of questions about why would he want to feed his baby to the snake? And I said, I don't know, maybe the baby was being bad that day. <laughs> yeah, well, when you're, uh, when you're doing research and you're in a remote place, um, 
we lived in Northern Australia, which is in an Indigenous community, Aboriginal community up there. And um, the research must go on. And so we would put our newly born son, who's probably about four months old in that photograph, um, into the car at night and we'd go off with our radio tracking gear and do our surveys. And I think we must have found a snake close to the road. And so we thought, hey, it'd be nice to get a little souvenir for when he's older. And so I caught the snake and had a photo of him on my lap with the snake, looking quite enthralled, I thought. <laughs> It was funny. People, I mean, I saw it and I was like, oh my God, this is terrifying. But I was like, effective snake bait to catch a snake. Baby thing is delicious to a snake. Exactly. That species actually, talking of, I mean, it's not just Indonesia and far off places. I was radio tracking one snake. That, that's Australia's largest species of snake, the one I'm holding, not the individual, but that species grows to be the largest, up to eight meters long. And one of the snakes I was radio tracking actually crawled into a friend's house um, grabbed her on the bum and tried to wrap her up and, and eat her. And this is in, this is in Australia. So it's, wow. it's, it's pretty serious stuff. And that's happening. And you can imagine, you know, really rural places in Africa and Asia, that becomes a, a real consideration for a lot of people. And, and um, yeah. So, talk, so before we dropped you off, I wanted you to talk to people about like the shock value that some of these videos that people see with the snake with the beating heart and the snakes moving. Can you explain a little bit of the physiology of these animals and why some of these things are ridiculous videos for someone who's a scientist to see? Snakes and crocs are cold-blooded. You all know the generic term cold-blooded. There's actually more to it than that. They're what we call ectothermic. They don't, unlike birds and mammals and human beings, we generate our own body heat. Reptiles require the sun or an external source of heat to regulate their body temperature and therefore regulate their metabolic processes, like digestion, for example. Is this the same um, crocs too? That's the same with crocodiles, and that's why you see crocs and gators sitting on the side of a, a lagoon basking in the sun for ages. They're actually sitting there digesting something or getting their enzymes working to do something else or make sperm if you're a male. Any, any sort of process that we take for granted because our bodies do it ourselves, they have completely different physiologies and they need another heat source, typically the sun, to get a lot of those processes that we take for granted to, to get them going. So these things, like I said, have completely different physiologies. And one thing about reptiles, and in particular aquatic reptiles, like a crocodile or a gator or a big snake that lives in a swamp, they have a, have a we would say they have a strong resistance to hypoxia which is basically a lack of oxygen in the blood. We can hold our breath for, if someone's good, they hold their breath for four minutes, a human being. These animals can hold their breath for up to 30 minutes. And they can also tolerate much lower levels of oxygen before they would pass out or go unconscious. And what that means is that their muscle tissues have, a, have changed over time to be the same. And so their muscle tissues do not need the amount of oxygen that ours do, and so that they can keep functioning, whether you're doing a, a, a bicep curl or whatever, we would rapidly get lactic acid build up and we would, it would start to hurt, whereas they can keep on going and keep on going um, with very low levels of oxygen. And so what happens when you're killed, you can be killed absolutely humanely, you're your, your brain can be destroyed, you're unconscious, you're, you're gone, you're feeling no pain. Because that happens, there's no longer any oxygen being pushed around the bloodstream and getting to the muscles, and we shut down almost instantly. The same is not true for snakes and crocs and many reptiles because they already had oxygen in the muscles. They didn't need a lot to begin with for those muscles to function, and so the muscles just keep functioning like normal. They keep responding to stimuli. You touch a snake on the tail after it's been 
absolutely humanely killed using um, using standard procedures, and it will react as though the snake was alive. And that obviously makes great viewing for an animal rights organization or somebody who thinks it's morally wrong and offensive to use these animals because they prey on a naive public who don't know any better. You know, we live in a world of fake news and all these sorts of things, and they're basically lying to people and saying this animal is still alive when it is absolutely not. And because we associate death with lack of movement, because we mainly understand mammals and birds that will stop moving instantly when they die, when we don't see the same thing in a reptile, we automatically suspect that the person is telling the truth and that, yes, indeed, that animal is alive. Whereas I have done experiments on, I've worked on um, ways to improve humane killing in reptiles and these sorts of species. And a heart, for example, can continue beating for up to four hours after the animal has been absolutely unequivocally proven. Yeah. To so so the, one, of the, one of the things that I saw in one of the videos, it was a heart of a snake in someone's hand and it was beating and they were like, oh, it's still alive. And I'm like, it's, it's just a part. I mean, it's like a Frank, it was like a Frankenstein kind of thing where, mm. you know, you know, I mean, even still, you know, you watch it and, and the snake was still moving. So, you know, you're thinking because you associate it, just like you said, we are, um, we associate that we feel the way we feel or the way we act is the way something else would act. You know, we do that all the time. That's a classic uh, thing that, you know, everybody always thinks that just because th what they know is what the way it should be for someone else. And that's not, that's not the case. So, um, I appreciate that explanation because I've always just said, you know, I've, I've always used the explanation. Um, I was quite a lizard catcher as a child and I would catch them and they would get, do everything they could do to get away from me and they would shed their tail. And then mm, the tail would great, still be moving example. there. But I know the lizards, the tail's not alive. It's just a, you know, a natural mechanism. It's a defense mechanism to shed its tail. It'll grow a new tail. Um, but the moving is just the nerves firing, right? Exactly, exactly And right. And so, um, you know, another another question that I have um, that I think would be interesting is how do um, governments and like CITES policy specialists, because this is one of the things that people had asked about is, you know, overhunting. So how, what is it that governments are doing? What is a non-detriment finding? How have you helped governments um, like, Malaysia, Indonesia, Australia, to do their non-detriment findings, to make sure that any of these trade, any trade in these specimens or these species is not going to, um, you know, cause them to go extinct. Okay, so where to start? The, f the first thing to make perfectly clear is that for, for many species used in the leather industry, we're not actually concerned about the conservation of the species itself. We, we, we use trade often in the money generated from trade to protect habitats. As conservationists, that's, I, I said earlier, you asked the question, Christy, what is the number one extinction process for animals, wildlife on earth? It's habitat loss. It is never going to be trade. I mean, for a few species, what a, a rhino horn, maybe some elephant ivory, some other things, one or two species in the millions and millions of species on earth. The reality is that most of the animals that are being used for the luxury leather industry will never face extinction due to trade. That being said, we still need to prove that to the public. We need to prove it to policymakers and so on. And so we need really good data, really good information to show that that is true you can't just you know call up a, an incredibly handsome guy like me and and get <laughs> and get them to say that, that that there's no risk for species you need more than that you need the hard data from the ground and that is what a CITES non-detriment finding is and essentially it's an assessment of risk it looks at data on the population of a species it looks at what are the management protocols in place? It wants to look at um, 
if someone gets caught doing something wrong with wildlife, are there, are there good enforcement policies in place, et cetera, et cetera. And so many of these countries, or well, not many of them, all of them that trade in CITES listed species, so your gators, your crocs, pythons, um, water monitor skins, those sorts of species that are listed on CITES Appendix 2 and are being taken from the wild, the government of that country, and again, the wildlife department of that government, is required legally to produce a non-detriment finding before, which is non-detriment finding, to prove that the harvest is sustainable before they can export any of those wildlife. So if Christy rings up and goes, hey, want to get this many croc skins or this many python skins from Indonesia, for that export of, say, 10 skins, the Indonesian government has to prove and do a non-detriment finding legally as part of CITES to show that the offtake of those 10 specimens and that single export is going to be safe biologically for the wild population. And so there are many things that go into creating a good, robust NDF that give you confidence. That is often science. That's my... Uh, my area of expertise is doing the science on wildlife to show that, hey, that population is actually very, very healthy and trade is, is having absolutely no negative impact. And so we help governments in, in places like Indonesia and Malaysia to achieve that by getting teams of people out surveying wetlands and crawling through swamps and counting animals and doing this and all this nerdy science stuff that I won't bore you with, which is actually lots of fun, if you're me. I'm sure some of you would like it too. Um, the sort of stuff you see on National Geographic, we get to crawl around doing these things, and that's the science that underpins, um, that underpins all of this trade. So this is not some crazy free-for-all of these you know, nutters using animal skins and wildlife for any purpose. This is incredibly highly regulated and um, actually has a lot of science underpinning what's what's being done. What, um, you know, what one of the things that, you know, we had talked about is the fact that, um, you know, the meat of these animals is eaten. Um, mm. And a lot of people don't know this, but you know, crocodile, alligator, snake, and lizard meat, it's all eaten. So people think that, you know, the only thing that we're using is the leather, which is not at all the case. And, um, you know, you had told me that actually, you know, we, there's been a lot of heat lately about the coronavirus, which is why we're all home right now, um, that I read an article saying that this thing could have possibly come from a snake and um, and then there was an article that came out that said it's it's next to nearly impossible that this came from a reptile um, because it's because of the physiology of the animal. It couldn't jump to a reptile so easily. Is that? Um... No, that, that, that's ex exactly right. First, I would say that, yeah, often skins are a byproduct of just like cattle. You know, we eat beef and you're not going to throw the skin away. You're obviously going to use use it for leather. That's the responsible thing to do. Um it's the same with, with reptiles. It depends on geographically where you are. Sometimes the skin is the main reason the animal is traded, and that's where most of the value is. But people are still eating the meat. In some areas, you can't even get skins in parts of Indonesia because people get more money selling the snake for meat with the skin on. And so, yeah, meat is a, is a, is a big part of this, just like it is for crocodiles and alligators. Um, and to the question about coronavirus, it, it's exactly right. I mean, bats have been shown to have coronavirus genome sequences, so DNA in, inside them, that is most closely related to the current coronavirus. Um, we know that birds and mammals are harboring coronaviruses like this. The probability of... Let me, let me, let me explain it in a different way. I'll start again. Oh, sorry. We are pretty closely related to chimpanzees, say. Um, we are less closely related to dogs, but dogs are still mammals, um, of which we are. We're even less closely related to birds. And then way, way down the other end of the spectrum are things like snakes and crocodiles. 
I Although have a couple some people... of ex-boyfriends that were pretty closely related. I was so going to say, I was going to so... say. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, but we're pretty distantly related to these animals. We, we don't even, I explained earlier, we generate our own body heat. These animals can't. Their physiologies are just so very different. And so the probability that a naturally occurring virus can mutate so many times to make the jump all the way from over here to a snake to a human being as a mammal over here, it, it's, it's one in a million type stuff. It is so improbable to the point of basically being impossible. Whereas a pig or, a, or something else, a mammal that's closely related to this, the jump is only this. Still, the probability of that is pretty unlikely. Hence why this is the first pandemic that we've had that's really spread um, a long way in a very long time. You know, we had Spanish flu in the early 1900s, but that jump, even though much closer, is still quite improbable. So this is quite an improbable situation that we find ourselves in currently. And so what that means is, from the point of application, if it's almost impossible to get a disease like coronavirus or many other viruses from a snake, then that makes them in effect, a natural barrier to zoonosis or animal-derived diseases like this. And so there's an argument that I know may not be palatable for many of us, but certainly for Asian, for Asian people, eat more snakes. I mean, it's not just a natural barrier that means we're never going to get diseases and pandemics like this happening again, but reptiles are just so sustainable in so many ways. I mean, it takes, just, just as, a, as a couple of examples, not to, not to hijack the thread, but, I mean, it takes only 10% of the energy to produce one gram of snake protein than it takes to produce one gram of, say, beef or pig protein. So they're basically 90% more efficient at taking resources than the stuff that we're eating now. They require almost no water, they produce uric acid, which is concentrated urates, which is, I'm getting a bit technical, instead of peeing. But basically, um, they, we, they don't need a lot of water. Water scarcity is becoming increasingly um, an issue globally. And so they possess all of these credentials that make them incredibly sustainable. But like I said earlier, they live in habitats where they're meant to occur. They have zero ecological footprint, unlike a cattle beast or something and so you start listing all of these different attributes and reptiles really are the future and it i can understand why why we're not eating them and there's still an aversion to doing so and that's cool i still like a nice t-bone steak before i'm going to eat a chunk of snake um but for many cultures that's not true and so we should be as scientists we're also saying hey these are the facts and for those cultures in which reptile consumption is, um, is pretty common because it's part of their, their culture, then, then we're saying, hey, go for it because you're doing a lot more good from this planet than all the beef eaters like me. What, um, Dan, have you done as a scientist um, working with different governments or farms or anyone that's working in the reptile industry? What have you done to work with them on humane killing practices? Oh, what haven't we done? We've, so we have, as part of various initiatives and some of them led by caring, others led by conglomerates of luxury brands, We've conducted workshops throughout Southeast Asia, trained hundreds if not thousands of people in this industry how to humanely capture, how to humanely transport, how to humanely um, kill, how to, if they're temporarily holding the animals before they're killing them. Basically, you name it, from the point of capture the, to the point of killing or the point of captive breeding, if it's a breeding facility, um, to the point of of humane killing we have built enormous capacity throughout countries and communities in southeast asia in addition we've also done um, some sort of groundbreaking research on on killing methods like co2 for example i think 90 percent of the poultry and the pigs in europe and britain are killed using co2 
that knocks them out in seconds. It's never been tested for reptiles. And so we've tested it and it shows, it shows enormous p potential. Um, I won't go too much further than that because we've still got a lot of things in um, waiting to be published um, and peer reviewed and there does need to be more science um, done on exactly the different mechanisms you would use to administer CO2. But as, as, a, as a first snapshot, I can say that, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful technique. So not only are we figuring out new methods to improve welfare, but we're teaching people the best methods that we have currently in brands and tanneries and all these people have funded little small guys in Southeast Asia, getting them a, a, a state-of-the-art captive bolt gun or building a new abattoir for them and these sorts of things. So it's, there's, there's a, an, all, a, an awful lot of work being done. So really what, what role would you say that fashion designers and luxury brands have had in these, these things? I mean, would you, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but so from my perspective, I see that fashion brands luxury designers, tanners, um, and, and, you know, people that are invested in this industry, I see that we have done more to protect habitats, to encourage and foster, you know, healthy um, uh, populations of species, work with governments and work with suppliers for humane killing standards, and to try to create money for governments so that they're able to do good non-detriment findings. I personally see that our involvement far outweighs any animal rights groups and what they've done. Um, I have yet to ever see uh, any habitat preservation or work, real work on a large scale program from any animal rights group. And, you know, I just want to know your thoughts on that and how you, how you feel as a scientist. And maybe you've seen more things that I have. Maybe you've seen that Humane Society or any of these other groups have gone in and I don't know, maybe they've conserved species, but I've not seen it. No. So again, it's, we're making generalizations, which is cool. And the generalization is that, yes, you're correct. Um, but it's not always true. Um, there are, in, in my experience, and we know this because a lot of research has been done on this issue, that a lot of the funding that goes to these animal rights groups, indeed, many of the funding that goes to genuine, more, more credible conservation groups like WWF and WCS and the, these organizations. What is WCS? Know, is the, the World Conservation Society. Okay. Sorry, the, the Wildlife Conservation Society. Okay. Um, and, you know, they, they do some really good stuff, those organizations. They're not rights organizations. But still, they require public donations to work. And their CEOs get paid enormous amounts of money and huge amounts of money goes back into advertising. And considering how much they do get, an awful lot doesn't go to genuine conservation efforts. Now, animal rights groups like your Peters of the World and the Humane Societies are just another kettle of fish altogether they're far worse you know some of the data and and freedom of, freedom of information stuff that's come out is is quite shocking almost almost nothing relatively is going to wildlife conservation that being said um there are groups that are animal rights groups and are completely opposed to the use of exotic leathers and are completely opposed to any form of hunting and so on they do do a bit of work here and there, and in some of them, I shouldn't say here and there, do significant work conserving habitats and doing wildlife conservation in, in Asia and Africa. I think the reason why we, people, folk like you and I have a bit of a bias is because we're working on traded species. And so when it comes to species, because, because these groups have a fundamental position that opposes use of those animals, they absolutely disengage and they actively try and shut down real and genuine conservation programs that are funded by industry and that has a detriment to conservation. So it's quite a, it's quite a nuanced thing. In some cases, as you'd say, as you said, most of them are just not worth the paper their organization's names are written on, in my opinion. Um, we, we all care about the welfare of animals. I absolutely love and adore animals. Um, but we need to conserve them and 
to do that, sometimes we need to be pragmatic about how we do that. And that can be about engaging with trade and getting people to generate the money that it takes, because it always takes money, generating the money to uh, conserve those animals. Um, but there are some, like I said, that yes, they, they do do some habitat conservation work. It's just that on these taxa, the, one, the traded ones, no, they're, they're, they're not interested and they do far more harm than good for those animals. Well, you know, listen, I think that it's important to have a fair and balanced view of this stuff. And I think that, um, you know, I, I think that people hearing you talk about these things, it, it opens people's eyes and lets them know that, um, this stuff, there's not a, it's not black and white. There's a lot of gray area in between all of this stuff. And we have to sort of do, um, I'm trying to call me at once and I'm not answering the phone. Um, so one of the things that I've, I've heard a lot of conservationists say is that with wildlife conservation, you have to do what works. Um, and what works is, um, you know, you have to make sure that the people living in the areas with these animals are able to tolerate them, that governments are able to have enough money to regulate it, and that trade is there um, so that there's demand for the whole circle and cycle to work. Uh, and the habitats are protected, the landowners, everything. So, um, I don't know. It's, I've learned so much it, it, exactly, working with it, you, it, and it's been good for me. Well, look, that's exactly right. It's, that's the perfect way to put it. I'm, I'm not pro-trade. Some people think I am. I'm not pro-trade. I'm pro-truth. I'm pro-science. And I, when it comes to conservation, I'm pro-what works. And pro-what works means that every intervention that we do for the benefit of wildlife is context and case-specific. Sometimes not using animals is the best way to go. That's, a, that's just a genuine fact, and no one who's, who's objective could dispute that. The reality is, though, that in the vast majority of cases, we need enormous amounts of money to do much of this conservation work, and that money is coming from trade. And if trade wasn't there, the conservation work wouldn't happen and the species would suffer. So certainly there are some circumstances where, yeah, it's better to use taxpayers' funds, for example, and to put things in a national park but you can't just turn the world into one big national park. And so we are trying to be pragmatic and to reconcile the needs of an entire planet of human beings, almost 8 billion of us, against the needs of wild places and wild species. And that takes some pretty slick thinking. It takes some maneuvering and some understanding of people's needs um, and what makes them tick and what's going to incentivize them to say, hey, okay, I'll keep that big dangerous predator hanging out in my backyard, even though I know it could kill and eat me, um, okay. because I'm getting a benefit from, from, from it in another way. And so we do need to be pragmatic, and everything is case by case, and that's why we apply what works best, and the reality is the use of exotic skins and the enormous benefits generated by this trade are exactly what works in so many cases. Well, Dan, thank you so much. I'm going to let you get back to your family tonight and have some dinner. But I really, really appreciate you taking the time to come on here. Um, so Dan is new to Instagram. Uh, he is at epic.biodiversity. Um, and he hasn't posted any pictures, but he said he's going to get uh, his wife to do that. That's what, what he said. Uh, but, I'm, all, I'm also under the reptile wrangler on Instagram, where there's a couple more photographs. So. Yeah, okay. Um, so, and uh, if any of you guys are interested in learning about SARCA, which is uh, an initiative with brands, tanners, traders, um, it's the Southeast Asian Reptile Conservation Alliance. Um, they are taking on membership to people who would be credentialed. Um, or people who would be valuable, you do have to do some work. So being a member isn't just writing a check, even though your, you know, your check goes to, to conservation efforts, but it's also about getting involved and um, doing something. So if any of you have any questions about that, um, American Tanning is a member of SARCA. I know Pan American Leathers is also a member of SARCA and some other groups are as well. Um, I don't know who needs to get in touch with me that badly. Um, 
But if you're interested, you can reach out to me and I'll link you up with Dan uh, and some of the other people there. So I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you so much, Dan. You are awesome. Yeah, thanks, Christy. Keep enjoying your isolation. Okay. Keep okay. <laughs> you See too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.